Before I came to Oregon, I, I did have this concept of the Pacific Northwest being ferns and giant mossy trees. But then in the summer of 2001, I came out and was a member of a Forest Service wildland fire engine. We were seeing fires run faster, burn hotter, and get bigger than people had seen in decades. And then in 2002, I came back for a full fire season, and I was on the Prineville Hotshot crew. The Biscuit Fire, which we ended up staffing for a couple of weeks, was the biggest fire in Oregon's history. At this point, another fire has now taken over the number one spot. And seeing the water conflict that was all around me in that first summer really catalyzed my interest in getting involved with these sticky natural resource issues. So 2021 compared to 20 years ago in 2001 when I first got to Oregon, it's worse this year. This has been an extremely hard year for water. Across the state, stream flows are at their lowest measure point in recorded history. There have been documented fish kills. It's been a really bad year. Climate change is here in Oregon. Uh, we're seeing it across western states and it's marching north. We're seeing hotter, drier summers, less reliable snowpack in the winter. And places that we're really seeing it right now are the Rogue Basin in southern Oregon. And the first place that I'm gonna go check out is Elk Creek, which is a tributary to the Rogue. And it's really good coho habitat. So I'm hopeful that we're gonna find some baby coho uh, hanging out down there. So we see Chinook spawning in Elk Creek, um, and it's got really, really strong coho salmon uh, populations. They're generally considered cold water fish. You know, they're gonna be in places where the water temperatures are certainly below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So they need to have that cold water in order to make it through these brutal summers that we have in Southern Oregon. You know, in years past, when I've snorkeled this pool, and gotten to the mouth of West Branch, there's been substantially more water coming down the tributary. And that plume of cold water, I was feeling maybe 10 feet out from those rocks. And then it really got cold when your face was right up next to those rocks. And that's where we'd see uh, coho for in particular, just really kind of kegged up and lined up face into the flow. You know, you could almost like see them breathing. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is cold water with good dissolved oxygen levels, right? Um, so every year that you've been here before, have you seen coho? This is, this is the first time I've been here in August and not seen coho at this spot. I've also never seen West Branch that low. I've never seen that little water coming down that drainage. Um, I think endless, many, many, many repeated summers with flows at this level is really gonna, it's gonna pinch the coho population here in Elk Creek. Our water right system was built to prioritize using water outside of streams. And it was before a time when we recognized all of the values of having water flowing in rivers. There were no provisions to make sure that fish would have enough water to complete their life cycles. And so during your hottest, driest parts of the year, that's when your demand for irrigation, for instance, is going up. It's when your demand from cities is going up. And so you have this mismatch from natural supply versus human need.
going on, guys? Good morning. We want some food, is what yeah, they're they saying. <laughs> they're not going to get it for a little while. This is a cow calf operation. There are various irrigation ditches on both sides of the road that have been used for water and for irrigation for the last, since 1857. This will just build up a pool of water and then um, divert it to the side and flood this whole pasture. Usually in August and September, water is tight. I mean, you can look in the river and there's just not that much water in there. It's challenging. In 2001, we had a pretty heavy drought and that um, was the most restricted year we had up until last year. One thing that's really interesting with our water right system is it wasn't built to protect flows of rivers. The oldest water rights get satisfied first before newer water rights get satisfied if there's not enough water to go around. In 1987, they authorized water rights for the stream, but in most cases, those water rights are the newest on the system. So if you've got a, any sort of shortage, then the first one that's not gonna have the water right satisfied is gonna be the river's water right. Therefore the fish. Therefore the fish. Somebody's gonna be trying to keep those fish alive. You hope, right? You know, right. you hope you get to this point where even if the river's right is it's junior, junior, I know. That the users are gonna look at the river and go, Yeah, we Man, gotta keep something in there. Let, how can we work even outside the system right. to keep some water flowing? In-stream water rights were not a thing until I believe the late 80s. Before then, there was really no drive to keep water in systems for you know, fish culture, fish population. So without that in-stream right, there would be almost, almost no water here right now. It is complex. One of the most complex issues that uh, we're facing and unfortunately was becoming uh, more and more intense uh, as a result of scarcity. So we're here at Emigrant Lake, which is a man-made reservoir on Emigrant Creek, one of the uppermost tributaries in the Rogue Basin. Um, typically, there's around 40,000 acre feet, I think, stored here in this reservoir. Um, most of it's used for talent irrigation district um, to irrigate farmland here in this part of the watershed. Obviously, it's high and dry this year. And in my career, actually growing up here in the Rogue Valley, I've never seen this reservoir anywhere close to drained the way it is. I think when a farmer doesn't have access to water that's flowing by their property, that's a really hard conversation to have. And so you can't just sort of march in and do a particular transaction. It really takes that community engagement to make sure people are comfortable that for this chunk of water, the best use is maybe to support this important fishery. This chunk of water, the best use is for food projection. This chunk of water is best used for drinking water. And it, it has to be a dialogue around all of those pieces mm -hmm. um, for it to work well, because they are big changes. And when you're living in a world where there's plenty of water, you don't have to make those hard choices, but that's not the world we're living in right now. One thing that we could be doing a lot better would be measuring water use. Only certain water users, about 15% of all the water rights that have been issued in the state of Oregon, are required to measure and report their water use. And we don't have full compliance even with those 15%. This is such a fundamental input to a thriving Oregon that we have to start investing in it and managing it that way. And we need to create opportunities to bring people together. The reason we've gotten so far as a species is we are so creative, we are so adaptable, and we want to make sure that we're not victims of our own adaptability, where we just become used to this new normal, so to speak, instead see this as a call to action so that 
we can maintain productivity of lands while also maintaining productivity of our rivers for growing fish and supporting recreation economies, fishing economies. The more you understand how you can engage it, you can really get focused on what are we gonna do about it.